to um, catch up on um, any uh, on any of the Carifta games. The Carifta games were held in Jamaica this past weekend. Yes, and um, it's really just awesome to see our young people, you know, having worked hard, trained, made the sacrifices and to see their talents on display. It was truly heartwarming. So today, as we continue on this theme of recovery and resilience, we are looking at this business of improving productivity, looking at it in our Caribbean public sector context. Very, very pertinent topic um, for us as we are always seeking to transform more public services. You know, that is the tagline for CARICAD, transforming public services for the people of the Caribbean. And as we are looking at transforming public services, that, this is an element that I think we have not paid that much attention to, at least not directly as we will do in this webinar. How do we improve labor productivity? What is it? How do we improve it? Particularly in our context, you know, how is that going to actually help us as we are transforming public service delivery, making our services more impactful, more efficient, more effective? So that's what we're focusing on today. And before we get into the meat of the matter, this is a virtual learning space. And there are some ground rules that we like to remind ourselves about so that we can have the best possible learning experience. So you want to close all software applications apart from Zoom. You want to mute your various phones that are in your surroundings. If you can't mute them, well, at least to turn the ringers down low. Your colleagues, lovely as they are, we have to work with them, but they're often a source of distraction for you. So just remind them that for the next hour, you are unavailable. You want to just make this a very powerful, impactful um, learning experience for yourself and to lean into all the learning and to reap all you can from it. No, in a webinar setting, you're not really required to use your microphone as I am using it, mine. But if you plan on using it, then um, do, we do recommend that you have a good working headset and microphone if your challenge is with your inbuilt computer um, audio setup. And we have always have a bandwidth challenge. So if you have an internet cable, you get better bandwidth performance if you plug that in, all right? And of course, we are going to encourage you also to use the chat feature. The chat feature, you can um, post your comments, your questions as we go along. And certainly during the period when we'll have times for question and answers and more general discussion. So you see the lovely map of our Caribbean area here. And we would love to hear from you. Can you just kind of place in the chat, which country are you joining us from today? No, it might be somewhere in the Caribbean as well as it might be outside of the Caribbean. So Marsha, Marsha is a regular, works in, in BVI. Marsha, welcome. Simone also from BVI. You know, I, I just can't remember her name right now, but there is a young female athlete from BVI that just mash up the thing in Carifta yesterday. So I felt so proud, so proud. A friend of mine once said that I am Jamaican by birth, Caribbean by heart. And so I am, yes. So welcome Simone, Stephen from Trinidad, Michaela from Jamaica. Hi, Michaela. Jacqueline from Anguilla. Jacqueline, good to have you. 
Jacqueline always wants to be a part of us, but a lot of times when we have our webinar, they kind of clash with other things. It's so good to have Jackie here today. Isaac, one of our esteemed alumni from Grenada, Wayne from Jamaica, Sandra from Public Services International Caribbean. Sandra, always good to have you, our partner. A pa I don't, you know, people like to say partner in crime, we are partners in progress especially for our region. Joanna, welcome from TNT. Stachel from the Statistics Department in Antigua, welcome. Diane from Jamaica, Lauren from Trinidad, lots of Trinidad in the house. Simone, another regular. And if you are joining us for the very first time, also place that in the, in the, in the, in the, um, in the chat for us as well. So Marcia C. Adija Hodge is also joining, maybe joining with her. A. Francie from Jamaica, Robertine from Antigua, Michelle from Trinidad, Ellen from Belize, like it. Charolene, hi Charolene, that is one of my coaches from Antigua and Barbuda, 365 beaches, a beach for every day of the year, come on, represent. Michelle McLean from BVI, Catherine from Trinidad, Lynette from BVI, Shavorn from BVI, Reynolds from Trinidad, Sparkle. Hi, Sparkle. Sparkle it has done other courses with us from Grenada, Esther Innes. This is my sister from another mother. Hi, Esther from Trinidad. Oh, yes. Stephen. Hi, Stephen. Stephen said it is first time. Welcome. Where have you been? You have missed out. But guess what, Stephen? You can visit our YouTube channel where we have a lot of our webinars um, there already that you can go back to. And in fact, we are streaming live today by our YouTube channel. Josette from BVI. No, from, yes, BVI. Diane is also your first time. Great. Dr. Arlene Penn from VBI, first time. I love it. Oh, Adija Hodge. Yes, that's the name of the athlete from BVI. Thank you, Marsha. No man, good, good, good. Camille from Montserrat. Now, Camille is the permanent secretary of the Ministry of Health in Montserrat. So, you know, I feel so honored that she had the time to come. But I know it is also part of her ongoing learning. I love it. So you see, this is for people at leaders at every level. Laverne, you know, Lauren says also, also the first time. Great. Christina from Trinidad, Sharon John from Trinidad. Yes, yes, yes. I love it. I love it. I love it. So guys, you know, nobody um put a gun to your head. Okay. I see there's also Chantel from Barbados. Welcome, Chantel. Chantel is often with us, yes. And I just saw Michelle Darcy coming in. Treka, Treka from Jamaica. Great to have you, my dear. Great to have you. She is currently with us with our um, Leading Change workshop. And uh, so I, I think, you know, she, we invite everybody to come. This is part of the ongoing learning and development. To many of you, yes, you would have done our leadership program, maybe other leadership programs. But, you know, this leadership journey, it is exactly that, a journey. We are not arrived, completed, ever. We are constantly learning, developing, and growing in the art of leadership, in, in our craft as people. As in most of you, I believe, come from a public sector background. You know, we're never done. We're never done developing and growing. So this is part of our continuous learning and development strategy for our stakeholders to provide these learning opportunities. So there is this question on the board that we're asking because we know you are here because you want to be here and just you have an interest. Well, what exactly piqued your interest in this topic? What are you interested in learning about this business of labor productivity and how we might improve it. Mary Lynn, first time from Trinidad. Welcome, Mary Lynn. What are you interested in? I will shortly introduce our phenomenal guest presenter. And so part of 
you know, we want to know how we can meet your needs. What are the questions you want answered? And so then you can see, okay, are some of those questions answered or, you know, do we elaborate or pick up on some of these issues that you're raising later on in the discussion segment? So what are you most interested in learning about improving labor productivity in the Caribbean public sector context? So you can simply type that in the chat. If you want to just quickly raise your hand and to just share, you can do that also. So I'm just looking and monitoring, manning the chat, womaning the chat <laughs> to see those questions, those answers, those comments to this question that I'm posing here. So while I am um, waiting on some responses in the chat, I, I will take a little liberty and no, I was going to take and see, you know, ask somebody directly who I think I know would have a, you know, some interest. But Stephen has started the ball rolling. He says he's interested in learning how to maximize productivity and employee satisfaction at the same time. I love that, Stephen. Uh, one of the things we teach in um, in our program is a tool called polarity mapping, right? And because as leaders we are not necessarily dealing with black and white issues. We're not dealing with things with either or. So it is not maximizing labor, labor productivity or employee satisfaction. Because I think we're all sensible people here. We recognize we need both. But how do you manage in such a way that you're getting, you're fostering employee satisfaction while you're also fostering productivity? Isaac is raising a, a, a comment here. So Isaac he says, he's perplexed. We have so many qualified people in the public sector. Relatively stable system, good policies, but yet we're not achieving our full potential. No, that is an issue I have heard time and time again, Isaac. And you're right. On average, in the Caribbean, our employees are actually more academically qualified, more trained than the average employee in the private sector. And in fact, many private sector companies, I mean, there was one that I know of in one Caribbean country that the owner of that business made it his point of duty to not necessarily just poach the public sector, but you know, you're fine when people just retire, you know, they still have a lot of life and energy and whatever, to contribute, to recruit those people very intentionally because they tend to come with a lot of skills, know how to develop, implement policies and so on. So there is something that is off, Isaac, that is true. And so we need to talk about these matters, yes. Robertine says she's interested in labor matters and what is expected of us as work, all right? Sandra. Keen to hear the various perspectives from across the Caribbean. Things like definition, measurement in the context of our services. Yeah. No, yes, Sandra. I, 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 um, that is also my interest as well. Because I, um, we have not really focused, I believe, on measurement in the context of our public sector environment. And so the question I always have is, you know, what, what can be measured? And in a way that doesn't become cumbersome, yeah? How do we use that information to help to drive the transformation we're after? Do we need to make adjustments in measurement for the public sector context or even for the Caribbean context? What will work for us? And I, I'm a firm believer in, yes, being globally re relevant, global, you know, but we also want to be contextually relevant based on our context. Thank you for that. Joanna is interested in how do we use scarce resources to sustain current productivity? Esther is finding optimal ways to incorporate digitalization and different work options. Oh yes, because digitization has definitely um, broadened how we look at this business of labor productivity. Claude and Markello. We have another permanent secretary in the house, permanent secretary, Claudel McKellar, welcome, sir. 
in charge of uh, public administration and other portfolio areas in, in Trinidad. He is interested in the issue of measuring as well. How do we measure labor productivity in the, in the public sector context? And he wants to do, can we introduce the issue of public service profit and loss sheet? Mm. And that has implications for even how we do accounting, yeah? So it is the top of the hour and we are going to get right into the main event. So CARICAD, we are an uh, arm of CARICOM. We celebrate 42 years this year. And our role is to serve our 17 member states um, in the area of public sector transformation. And our work is guided by our charter for the public service. This is a common set of standards, a common framework that our member states can use in whole or in part to drive their public sector transformation initiatives. And if you want to learn more about that, please do visit our website at caricad.net. What we have here on the board at the moment is really what we call our charter house. It just sits out in the diagrammatic format, the basic principles of our charter for public services. And like any good house, it has its pillars and its six pillars are governance, standards, human resources, legislation, openness and accountability. And clearly, you know, part of our capacity building is providing these webinars. But you can well imagine that the issue of labor productivity cuts across many of these pillars, right? Including service standards, including accountability and particular um, performance management. So without further ado, I am going to stop sharing my screen and I am going to welcome, invite her to turn on her camera, um, Mrs. Tamar Nelson. Tamar is currently the Chief Technical Director for the Jamaica Productivity Center. The Jamaica Productivity Center falls under our Ministry of Labor and Social Security. So, you know, all things productivity, we, have, we went right to the experts. Okay, and let me tell you that she is well qualified. You saw she pretty. You like these kind of people, you know. You see the the, the brains and the beauty. They are like the full hundred. Okay, she who was a master's in industrial and systems engineering from the Rochester Institute of New York. She is a certified Lean Sigma sensei. I have to make sure I get the sensei right. You know the punch. So she knows what she's talking about. She's a certified scrum master. She's a certified energy manager. She's a professional engineer. Don't let the young looks fool you, okay? This girl has some years under her belt, all right? Over 20 years experience working in both the public and the private sector in a number of areas. Business process improvement consultancy she has helped to develop several improvement interventions, including training programs, energy solutions, productivity improvement strategies. So we have questions. No, no, wait till you have all the answers because Tamar is somebody who believes in continuous learning. So she will tell you she has learned some stuff and she's continuing to learn and we are going to be learning together. So Tamar, you can unmute, share your screen over to you. Wow, if you are the perfect type woman. Thank you for that introduction, Loy. <laughs> wow, and, and what fabulous guests you have today. One thing you forgot to mention, you know, is the, the first degree training in Trinidad and Tobago at St. Augustine. Oh Augusta. gosh, yes. Yes, yes. man. So, so you're Caribbean, you know, Caribbean at heart, Jamaican by birth. That's right. Yes. <laughs> Can't forget that, man. That was a, that was a melting pot of cultures right there and it was very instrumental in shaping you know who I am today so I always you know have about three moms still in Trinidad and I keep them very close 
So welcome everyone. Thank you so much for being here today and for, for sharing your time with us. This is the first working day back after a long productive holiday. And you know, this is the perfect timing for a discussion on productivity. We are starting a new financial year and you know, we always are looking for ways, how, how can we be better? How can we improve? And what better way than to speak about labor productivity? So I'm gonna share my screen. Just let me know if you are seeing it. We, we are for certain. Okay, Lovely, lovely. So we're here to talk about this whole matter of improving labor productivity, the pu public sector context. Now, if you know us at the Jamaica Productivity Center, you will know that we have a, a whole team full of persons very passionate about productivity, a whole team of nine individuals with a very huge mandate of driving productivity improvement in Jamaica and supporting global competitiveness for the well-being of individuals, organization, and industries in Jamaica. Very tall order. But you know, we are up for the task. In Jamaica, we have a saying that we say we're little but we tell our, but we can't do it without our partners and learning from others as well. So there's a huge measure of curiosity. We, we have our tripartite body who advises us. So the government, the labor unions, the, the employers all come together and advise us as, on, as to the way forward in terms of the strategies and how we can make the highest impact to improve productivity in our context. So, you know, we're gonna be sharing today some of our um, learnings based on our research, um, the studies that we have done, uh, you know, what we have observed through our consultations and um, through, you know, through other means with you and hope that we can have a, a great dialogue on, you know, how we can have a focused effort towards excellence. So, you know, this is a topic when you're passionate about something, you could really speak about it for a while, you know, a week even. And a lot of these topics could be a module by itself for, a, a, you know, almost a thesis. <laughs> but we, won't, we don't have that time, so we're going to condense it. And I love in the questions that I have seen coming through, um, love the dialogue, and I wanted to utilize the chat as much as possible so that we can have a conversation, although we, you know, so I can feel that energy coming through. And, you know, one of the first places to start with with any improvement initiative is, is knowing where you are and understanding what is. And so to start off, you know, I want to go into the whole matter of what really is productivity. We, we use the term a lot, we, you know, use it loosely oftentimes, um, but do we really know what it is? So I'd like to ask you, the audience, to really sh to share in the chat, what does productivity mean to you? And I'll give you a minute to just share a few thoughts. What does productivity mean to you? When you hear that word, productivity, what does it convey? What does it evoke? All right. Maximizing outcomes, Stevens, thank you. Results, Isaac, absolutely. Output over input, efficient output. Michaela, thank you. And Claudette. Right, so we're talking about efficient. We've seen some keywords coming up there results, using resources to achieve objectives, getting the most out of output. Nisha, thank you, Sasha, thank you as well. Um, any other thoughts? So, we're having a lot of you know, great, yes, thank you. We have a great um, meeting objectives efficiently and effectively. Achieving consistent outcomes, profit, quality of output, quality over quantity, progress. Wow. Yes. So it really means, you know, a lot to everybody. And you see the, the, the varying perspectives. Achieving public value, the level of efficiency in production process, 
achieving maximum results with available resources. These are great explanations. And thank you for sharing this Sparkle, Davis, and everyone else. So thank you, Claudette. Right. So one thing productivity is, is not actually, right? Let me just get my screens. Right, so production and productivity <clears throat> is not the same thing, right? So production deals with how much output. You, you're pushing out things, but it doesn't speak to how much output given the inputs, right? So production and productivity are not the same things and should not be used interchangeably. That's one thing. It's also not <clears throat> working harder. Working harder it does not mean you're more productive. It's also not an event. It's more of a journey. It's something that we do continuously. You know, Lloyd mentioned continuous learning. A lot of you are a continuous learner. We can't say we have arrived. We have to continue to improve and to see what exists and to see what the changes are in the environment. It's, it's the same with productivity. It's not an exam that you just pass and you forget about it. And it's not about just going faster. What it is, is looking at efficiency and effectiveness as one of the participants has, has mentioned. So it's how well we are converting our inputs into outputs and how well these inputs are converted into outputs. Or efficiency can be described as doing things right or doing things the right way. And also effectiveness can mean doing the right things. I'm going to share a quote that um, Peter Drucker, a management consultant, he said in, you know, from about the 1960s that, that I really like. And he said that there is nothing quite so useless as doing with great efficiency, something that should not be done at all. The question is, are we doing things that we shouldn't be doing? Are we spending our time on the most important things? Are we doing these things right and doing them the right way? Are we doing, are adding value? Or are we doing things because this is the way we have always done it? And one thing I like to ask is that, are we doing the same things that we were doing last year? 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. If we are, probably we are not doing things as efficiently and as, as effective as we should be. So we really need to take a look at these things. And these are questions that we need to ask ourselves in these times that we are living in now, <laughs> more on a daily basis, not waiting for year end or the end of a a medium term, you know, is something that we have to constantly ask ourselves and not hold on to things because this is, you know, our baby or this is something that, um, you know, was instituted years ago by so-and-so. But look and see, are we meeting the needs of our customers? Are we serving the public in the best way, in the most efficient and effective manner? Are there possibly things that we are holding on to that, could be outsourced, that could be turned into an industry that could make um, you know, income for persons uh, in, in, our, in the public space, right? So these are questions, hard questions that we need to ask because we're looking at transforming our inputs into outputs, into the intended outputs, our outcomes in the most efficient and effective way. So when we look at even the, the mathematical definition of productivity, which is output over input, which you know, our participants have rightly um, you mentioned earlier. Our outputs will relate to things that like are goods or services, the intended outcome in the public sector context. And our inputs, land, labor, capital, and time. 
Now, if we're going to be increasing productivity from a mathematical perspective, we can do one, increase the output. Right? And increasing the output will take, you know, more resources. Um, you know, it, it, there's a cost towards it. And we can also look at decreasing the inputs. Or we can look at both at the same time, increasing our outputs while decreasing our inputs. So there are multiple perspectives that we can look at. So one of the things when you look at all of these definitions of productivity, efficiency, and effectiveness, output over input, you realize that there is no magic bullet or silver bullet or no um, magic wand that you can wave and say productivity is improved. It's a, a holistic approach that has to be you know, taken as it re relates to productivity. And we're gonna go through some of the ways in which we can do so, some of the strategies that we can employ to ensure or to, you know, ensure that we are making the right kind of improvements in the right way, in the right direction. And there's another definition that I like to share with individuals, and this is a more philosophical definition. And I think this definition kind of, you know, I always loved it. But in the last two years, two and a half years, it, it just, you know, came to the fore even more, the, the, the profoundness of this definition. It says, productivity is, above all, a state of mind. It is an attitude that seeks the continuous improvement of what exists. It is a conviction that one can do better today than yesterday, and that tomorrow will be better than today. Furthermore, it requires constant efforts to adapt economic activities to the ever-changing conditions and the application of new theories and methods. It's the firm belief in the progress of humanity. Now, when you look at a definition like that, ladies and gentlemen, there are a couple of things that, that stand out. In the blue, you know, a state of mind, an attitude, a conviction, you know, that willingness, I can do better attitude on a daily basis, right? We also see, so you know, that 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 mind, the individual comes into play. So we're looking at, you know, how our thinking affects our thoughts and, and then our behaviors and then our actions. And in the yellow, you're seeing the actions, you know, the continuous constant adaptation and belief in progress that is necessary for productivity to grow and to improve. So you see, you know, we're looking at, you know, the definition before where we saw all the different inputs. And then you see all boiled down to who we are as individuals, how we think, our attitude towards productivity, and you know how we act on those, the, the mindset and the thinking and the attitude and the conviction that we have. And so if we if we look at productivity holistically, the benefits are tremendous. You're looking at Enhanced employee well being and attitude, increased earnings and public revenue boosts, reduction in waste, because you know, we are seeing a lot of waste in our systems when we go into organizations, public and private. This is these are things that we observe. Uh, you know, it facilitates growth and improve organization and procedures. So you know, you get that flow, that synergy. Uh, when, when everything comes together. And, you know, persons might think this is far-fetched, but it, it is achievable. And we'll go in and see, you know, how uh, we can do so. The converse is, is also true. High levels of poverty and in, in, inequality, um, larger rural populations, higher population growth rates, and external dependence, 
vulnerability to climate change are some of the spin-offs when we are not you know, increasing our productivity, our focused on productivity improvements. So it's something of great importance that we really need to focus on so that we can, we can not only survive, but thrive and to achieve the potential that we know we have, that we just want need to unlock, as was said earlier by one of the participants. So according to the World Bank, generating productivity growth and doing more with less is likely to remain a priority for governments, especially in this post-pandemic period. Now more than ever, we have to focus on productivity and improving productivity and develop frameworks and systems that encourage and facilitate this. So in the private sector context, you know, persons may say, well, what's the difference? You know, public and private sector, you know, they are, you know, they are probably the same thing. Uh, but, you know, let, let's look at it in terms of context and objectives. So from the private sector, you know, they're a little more flexible, funded by investments, you know, they have informed stakeholders, the objectives is more on competitiveness and maximizing profits. In the public sector context, we are funded by you know, tax revenues, funded by legislations, usually the, the technology standard right across, um, economic efficiency over technical efficiency, looking at you know, more the public good versus re reduction of wastes. Uh, and the, the outputs is that we provide citizens with either free or subsidized prices. But I think it was the PS of Trinidad who mentioned something um, in terms of, you know, looking at the public sector more as a profit and loss entity, you know. And I, I do agree with that. I, I, I firmly believe that we should operate like a private sector company, operate like a business, right? Let's, let's, let's put everything out there and see, you know, how can we... Um, not only serve our you know, customer service, but look at customer success. Because if our customers, the public who we serve are successful, then that means success for us. So you know, we should look at our resources as you know, scarce resources and to utilize them in the best, most efficient and effective manner and to be accountable for the use of such um, resources, right? Globally, the public sector accounts for about 25% of GDP and 38% of formal employment. And we're seeing that it, you know, in terms of the, the contribution or the size of the public sector, it, it varies from country to country in the Caribbean, we have a few that are listed here in terms of total employment. So, but it's, it's a pretty substantial amount. So we have something to contribute, a large, a large contribution actually. And we should take hold of it in terms of seeing that and everybody really aligning to contribute to this. In terms of the, the um, contribution in terms of dollar values, um, we have figures from 1960 to 2019 for a few countries listed here. And what we're seeing is, you know, a different story for, e for each country, right? Um, we're looking at, you know, the latest rates that we have here based on the conference board data that is analyzed by the JPC in terms of the labor productivity growth rates that we're seeing positive growth rates in the Caribbean as much as 51% from the DOMREP in the period 2019 and 42% uh, in Trinidad and Tobago. And we're seeing positive growth rates in others, not as high, and for Jamaica, you know, negative growth rates. So these are not um, things that we are, we need to brag about, but these are, indicating what we need to focus on and improve, all right? And these are also other growth rates 
for the 2019-2021 period, where um, we're seeing some changes in the pandemic and we're still continuing in terms of our analysis to see you know, what the post-pandemic impact has been. But the fact is that you know, um, there has been some changes, there has been impact and what we need to do is to, to focus on improving on this. So in terms of the factors that would affect these rates can be very extensive. So on a broad context, it could be um, the quality of our fixed assets, for example, um, which could have a long run effect on productivity. The organizational structure, leadership, and I know Caricad is big on this um, measurement, as was mentioned in the comments, as we started earlier, is very, very key. Going back to Peter Drucker, the management consultant that I quoted earlier, one of the things he always said is what, what is measured improves, right? So we have to beef that part up. And we touch a little bit more on that. In terms of the people aspect, skills, ability, motivation of the workforce is very, very critical. And also external factors such as the environment and stressors, stressors you know, having an impact on psychological safety. This is something that is affecting organizations worldwide and, and also industries to the point where ISO has now rolled out a, a new ISO standard in October of last year that just deals with psychological safety and how organizations can pay attention to that so that we can improve the quality of our workforce their, their mental state so that they can focus on improving productivity. Other, uh, other factors, and these are just a list on an organizational level, are many. So there's a whole host of things that can affect productivity, as you can see, just, just based on the conversa conversation so far. Um, you know, competition in the market, the business environment, technology, HR policies, management approach, behavior of employees, motivation, quality of leadership. Uh, so it's, it's a long game and a continuous one in terms of looking at improvement. But there are opportunities within the Caribbean and um, we are seeing this. So even though we have the impact of COVID in terms of, you know, some of the studies showing longer wait time, we're also seeing that um, there are some, some who have responded in terms of better performance in the workforce as a result of, you know, taking hold of the opportunities. And one of the things that COVID did provide was a look into the opportunities that exist. One thing that disruption does, it, it highlights your weak areas. So as organizations, as leaders, would have seen what was highlighted during that time, what broke first. And I would encourage us as leaders to not turn a blind eye to those things, but to really pay attention to them because that's, that would give an indication of where the low hanging fruit is and what needs to be fixed immediately. And the thing with disruptions, especially in these times, you know, today it might be a pandemic, next week it might be a fire, and next week it's a hurricane, an earthquake, you know, with a social, you know, social unrest. Uh, so they are coming fast, they are coming furious, they are staying with us longer. So we need to really make use of these opportunities. And one of the things I like to say is that, you know, we have to really be practicing that kind of agile productivity where we are flexible, adaptable um, to these changes and have the teams so enforced and, and um, energized that and focused that we can, you know, ride the waves of these challenges together. So in terms of productivity in the government service, we're gonna need 
to continue delivering high quality services, but more cheaply and improve our services and transform how we deliver the services, right? And if you notice the quote here, it mentions um, carefully planned and monitoring is going to be key for that to happen. And this is even more so as we see the shifts happening in the future of work. So there are shifts in behaviors, there are shifts in technology, there are shifts in the workforce, there are shifts in terms of um, mobility and globalization. So are we embracing these, um, these trends and utilizing them as opportunities? Something to consider. We're also seeing, we're also seeing the evolution of the employee where the employee today is not the employee that we had a few months ago or a few years ago. We're looking at an employee you now who wants to work anytime, anywhere, um, focused on outputs. They want to contribute. They want to be seen. They want to be heard. They want to be aware of things, um, be able to customize their work so to have the best outcomes. Uh, you know, they want to learn, they want to grow. So we, we can't treat them like employees of the past, but we have to really change the model in terms of how we create and lead our teams into the future of work. Now, so we're moving from a more reactive to a more predictive our preventative uh, way in terms of how we operate to minimize the, these disruptions or these waves, so to speak, because they will happen, but it's how we, we, we deal with it. Um, I'm probably will be going a little bit quickly through because we have a, just a few more minutes left, but just note that these, this information will be shared with you after the this session is ended. So you can have this information at your leisure. So in terms of strategies for improvement, oh, let me just hear from you. You know, what, what are some ways that you, you, you know, if you close your eyes for a minute and, and um, imagine the ideal public service, what would that look like to you? What would you want to see? What would it feel? What would it look like? Could you type in the chat for me? What are some, what, what would you want to see that public service look like? Mm. So Colleen says she would love to see a remote work option become a regular part of the public service. Of course, for those positions that can accommodate it. Colleen, I hear you. And um, there are many that share your view as well. And, uh, you know, um, we, we got a lot of learnings from, from COVID that we can work remotely, we can you know, um, implement systems. It will need, however, a new way of, of managing and, and leading our teams. It will be a little bit more involved, um, a, a lot more coaching, a lot more communication, and definitely a focus on measurement to make that happen. But I think we shouldn't just put a pause on all the learnings that we have and go right back to where we were pre-pandemic because we'd have lost all of that knowledge that we have gained over that time period. And we don't want to be behind the eight ball because the world is moving ahead, right? Hybrid is now the way of the future. So let's not um, give up on some of those gains. Tools and systems for remote working, absolutely. Definitely the technology for collaboration, for example, um, and holding those hybrid meetings very efficiently would, is something that we can, we can improve on so that we can collaborate across borders, et cetera, and even reduce the traffic on the roads. And, um, you know, which would again also improve productivity when everybody's out at the same time. More teamwork, less duplication in the ministries. Yes, more valuable input, output, more meaningful in some instances, more customer service, 
And as I said before, you know, let's look at customer success and a need to digitize the routine work. Absolutely. Greater skills and competency matching. Yes. Put people where they can thrive. And a client focused and updating legislation and policies to reflect the current challenges and needs. Everything needs to be updated now. Um, again, the last two and a half years has changed everything and we really need to really look at, at those legislations and policies and see what, what needs to be done to improve. So thank you for that, um, for those comments. Michelle is also saying, she wants to see a public service run in accordance with up-to-date laws and regulations and also greater accountability. Absolutely, Michelle. Thank you for those comments. Vera wants to see a public service that's efficiently and effectively run, ensuring that customers experience minimal stress with their transaction at the public offices. Yes. Yes. No, indeed, I, I quite agree. There is a very interesting study, colleagues, that was done by the Inter-American Development Bank. Now, all of your countries might not be members of the IDB, but it is still a very interesting study. And it looked at this business of transactions, you know, um, because a lot of the times that our citizens, our clients are interfacing the public service is with specific transactions, right? Eh? Yep, you're getting your NIS pension, your insurance pension, you're getting, um, you're applying for your driver's license, you're applying for some, you know, a police record, you know, to name a few. And so quite a number of the interfaces, you know, the services are, you know, they're done through transactions. And so we do need to then look at, well, how do people carry out these transactions? Is it manual, is it in person, is it online? Um, how, how user friendly is it? What's the turnaround time? Do we even track these things? I even wonder if, if we were to ask you for your ministry department, do you have a list of all the services you provide? Would you have that list? And for many organizations, I tell you, the answer would be no. We can go deeper than that lie in terms yeah. of the transactions is to really map your processes and seeing, you know, are we actually doing things that need to be done? Um, you know, where are the waste in the system? Yeah. Uh, could, could parts of the process be outsourced? Do we, we still need to do that? Do we still need that sign off? Could this be done with AI technology, for example? Are there routine things that we could actually um, have design a bot? To, to accomplish while we use the resources that we do have and focus it on, on you know, improving the customer service aspect. And that's something that we promote at the Productivity Center. And we have been helping um, public sector entities to achieve in terms of really digging into the process and looking at things differently because we have to do things differently in this dispensation. We can't, it's not business as usual. No, most definitely. All right. Um, so, you know, key is measurement and monitoring. We have to measure. So, you know, using that example that I gave, looking at your, your systems, how long does it take? Set a target to say, hey, this should, you know, look at the process, you know, take out what doesn't work and say, well, this should really not take three days. It's something that can be done in half an hour. Let's come together as a team and see how can we do this in half an hour that, and test it. And then continuously improve, set a target next year for 28 minutes when that is achieved, but also celebrate the process as well. Get persons involved. They know how to fix the system. They are on the ground. They are dealing with the customers. They know what to do. And, they, and you know it's a valuable resource that we have that we need to tap into is that collective wisdom of these very brilliant minds that are within the public service. Don't constrain them, um, allow them to thrive and to think outside the box, to be curious, to, to make mistakes and that's fine. Um, you know, control, you know, I mean, we tend to say well, everything has to be perfect, but progress over perfection. 
you know, and we have a, a team here that seems to, to really love to, to grow. And that's, that's commendable. And that's something we don't want to lose um, sight of that allow persons to grow on an individual level, because as individuals grow, the organization grows, and to do it together. Um, in terms of other improvements, you know, we spoke, I think one of the participants spoke about quality and quantity, and, you know, there are different measurement approaches. And this is, uh, again, something that we could do a whole workshop on, but, and this will be shared, but, you know, you, you want to, focus on both uh, in terms of the public service and you know find that that middle ground and see what works for your organization also you know we need to really look at the indicators that we are measuring you know are they lagging indicators or leading indicators right are they something that 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 really keeps us ahead of the game and how are we measuring them is it after the fact you know, three, three you know, quarters down, a year after the fact, we can't be responsive in that, in that manner. So we need to get to a point where we have data as real time as possible and measuring only what matters. We don't want a whole list of things that are really not telling us anything. And if we're measuring the same thing that we were measuring um, five, 10 years ago, we're measuring the wrong things. So these are things that we have to assess on, um, on a regular basis to really see, you know, what we are measuring, because what we measure matters and what we measure improves. So anything that we want to improve, if we're not measuring it, we're going to be stuck with the same thing. Pay attention to it, focus on it, put the resources towards it. And the thing with measurement is that um, when you have an area that has a bottleneck, for example, you know, a pipe and you fix it, it, it flows, right? but then it might have a restriction somewhere else. So you move again and you improve that area. You continue to improve that area. But next we move from area to area. It's a continuous process. It's not an event that we just do and forget, but we have to continuously to be looking at ways to improve. So it's really the time to, to adapt, to, to strategically look at our organizational objectives and also our culture. Peter Drucker again joined on his quote that culture eats strategy for breakfast. Not that culture uh, strategy is not important, but you have to build the underlying cultures that can support the strategy and move the strategy, not from a nice document that you know, we're good at putting together, but to really act on this strategy. That's where the improvement comes. So we, we are very good at putting plans together but not so great on the execution. If we can get to the point where we are executing, continuously executing, even if it's baby steps, we will see the improvement happen. But it doesn't make sense to identify the area for improvement and have it say, oh, you know, this is something that needs to be fixed. We have to pay attention to it, focus our efforts on it, improve and act on these items. Um, digital transformation is very important. We are in that space and time. We don't want to be left behind, right? This is the way we have always done it, pushing the paper, et cetera, yes. But um, as we have seen, we need to get with the program um, to get to reap the gains from it. And some of these are, are very small investments. And if we do the cost benefit analysis, we'll see how much resources it frees up um, you know, how much time it gives us back that we can really spend on the things that matter the most. And that's what we're talking about with productivity, efficiency and effectiveness, focusing on the things that matter and add value. So, you know, you want to look at your employees. Engagement is a big piece of the puzzle, right? Uh, I think somebody mentioned it before, how we can... Um, get the full potential of our labor and, uh, in terms of productivity and properly engage them, they are inextricably linked, right? That engagement is important. Happiness also is linked to the engagement piece, right? Um, and this is something that we have to pay attention to because when persons are engaged, they're all pulling in the same direction and we can have higher productivity. 
this is uh you know one study that was done recently and you know this is a broad brush <laughs> in terms of the survey results looking at in a typical environment how many persons are engaged 31 percent and you know we in rochester we used to have rowing teams that you see them on the river and everybody is pulling in the same direction at the same beat and they are flying down the river now when you have persons in the middle that are what you call dead weight and those that are pulling in the wrong direction, how do you think the organization is going to move forward? They can't. They won't. So we need as many people in the green side moving in the same direction, having that a or and moving it on beat in the same um, rhythm. That's how we get the flow. That's how we get the productivity. We can't forget the people. We can't forget the engagement. So we have to change how we think. Yeah. About Hi, Tamar. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the time is going on. Persons have started to right. put some questions in the chat. Sure, sure. Right. So um, if the, the question that Cecilia Blake has posed, you know, do managers really have time to address the productivity issues that you're talking about? So just bring that question in mind. All right, Cecilia, good, good questions. Good question to ask. But if you don't address the issue, you'll never have the time. What happens is that we, we, we find ourselves always in a firefighting mode when you don't address the productivity issues. So it's, it's like um, effort is required and you have to put in the upfront work, which requires, um, you know, it's going to be hard. It's not going to be easy, but it means pulling everybody together and kind of blocking out the time to focus on dealing with the issues. And then when the issue is cleared, you will see that you have more time to focus on other activities, but it's not going to be a comfortable process. You know, you, you have to be vulnerable. You have to admit to certain things uh, that not going right. Uh, you have to ask really hard questions, but in time, it does free up your time and the resources to focus on the more important things. Because you see, as managers, sometimes why we don't have the time is because we're doing it alone. We are the only yeah. one pulling in that direction. So when you yeah. get that, when you, you work on the team and get their buying and engagement, then if you drop the bar, for example, there's somebody there to, to help, to pick it up. When, you, when everybody is on the same page and pulling in the same direction, it's not as burdensome. And so you come out of the firefighting mode and be able to focus on more visioning and strategic thinking that can help to then further pull the organization in the growth direction that you want it to. Yeah. I mean, Esther Ennis, you know, she, you know, in the comment in the chat is just so pointed. The real yeah. question is, can we afford not to? Yeah, I afford not to. Yeah. And I think um, Esther is not that, we know what we need to do, but oftentimes we have um, blocks, you know, it, it could be egos, it could be, well, um, you know, you're not wanting to admit that this is, this is something that needs to be done or, you know, that fear of change and what that might look like. Uh, letting go of control, you know, um, it might be some reasons why persons won't go the route of improving productivity. And then, you know, for many, it's still something that, uh, you know, that it doesn't um, come home to them, the importance of it. But I think once you do understand it, that is easier to do because you see the win-win for everyone. Are there any other questions? I'm not seeing any other questions in the chat so far. Oh yes, here's to see, she's asking again. Should organizations employ a person with special skills who will address productivity issues? Hmm. Well, oh, that's a, another good question, Cecile. I think there, there are benefits like, um, you know, my background is in industrial and systems engineering. And I remember when I graduated from St. Augustine, um, well, I was recruited, you know, right in college to work in 
the bauxite industry. And, you know, at first, they, they kind of struggled to say, okay, you know, how are we going to utilize the skill, you know, and where, but after they understood the value of having someone that can focus on improvement that it can make to the organization, it was, you know, smooth sailing from there. I mean, you know, every year my job title to change to wherever the bottleneck was. So I got a chance to work in every part of the operations. And, um, you know, I think there should be a focus on business improvement. If you don't, even if you, don't, you can't hire a specialist with the skills to do so, um, you can buy the skills, um, for example, on a, you know, as a consultant or train individuals within your team so that they can be ambassadors for productivity, as it were, that can or just focus on issues. Because oftentimes we know what needs to be fixed, it's just to, to actually do it. So even if a simple thing I, I would share, you know, while I was in Japan, one of the things in terms of productivity improvement that they focused on was um, having everybody involved. No, they weren't trained productivity specialists, but what they did, they had a system of continuous improvement. So a suggestion system where employees could identify an area that would make their jobs a lot easier and be given the res once it's assessed and approved, given the resources to go ahead and fix it. And they were empowered to do that. And every month it was a new suggestion from, from each employee. Now, can you imagine, no, look at the size of the public service. If every employee were to submit one improvement initiative, not even per week, per month, right? And given the resources latitude to improve on it, that's 12 improvements per employee per year and you multiply that by the size of the public service, that's continuous improvement to the nth degree. So oftentimes we, we, we would tend to want to look outside for the improvement and where to look to improve, but many times we already have what we need to improve and we just need to utilize it to the full. No, I quite agree. And it, it may I add to that point, um, yeah. you know, in today's day and age, there's just about everything that you, can, you need to learn. You can learn it if you want to. Absolutely. And one of the things that I encourage people to do, and it's part of continuous learning and development, is use the access to online webinars, workshops, blogs, books, videos. There are so many ways in which we can learn Absolutely. You know, so many things, including how we can improve business processes. So I think there is a space for the specialist. Yeah. Um, but you are going to find a good specialist will come and be working with your team to engage them just to really create a structure and the context to pull out the suggestions from the very same people. You know, so what we need to do is to really, it's about leaders having the mindset that, hey, productivity is important. We need to be in a mode of continuous improvement and to engage that team to say, how can we get it done? Yeah. Yes, Sandra, I see your point and I, I do agree. And, um, and that, that's something that really needs to change as it relates to not, not shooting down because what happens when you, you know, that, that um, that, that illustration, uh, the, the law of the lid with the, when you have, I think it was fleas that were, that could jump, you know, how many meters and you put them in a, in a bottle and close the lid. And every time they jump, they hit the lid. That even when you remove the lid, they're not going to jump outside, even though they have the capabilities. That's what happens when we, we crush that creativity. And, um, you know, when you cr crush creativity and the curiosity, you also crush innovation. And that is something that is going to be absolutely important going forward in the future, is really fostering innovation within our teams. 
allowing them to, to make those suggestions and, and running with those suggestions and be open to, to, to hearing them and facilitating those, those um, suggestions to be implemented and to see what happens because uh, one of the things that, that um, you will see in the handouts because we don't have the time to go through is that you know from uh, cross-generational teams Right, uh, not just you know our age group, our thinking, not even our own industry, because we can learn phenomenal things outside of the public service that can be applied in the public service. So we don't want to just stick to the public service. Look what look what's happening in the food manufacturing. Um, you know, I was talking to a friend of mine, and he said, you know, talk to a baker in Bulgaria and and find out what what he's doing and how he's serving his customers, you might see something that would apply, you know, right to your teams right now. So, you know, we need to foster that, that innovation that, in that culture. Tamar, we're almost at the end. And what I um, would like to just give you another minute to just say if there was one parting thought you want to leave with us what would that be in this area of improving labor productivity in the Caribbean public sector context? Thank you, Lai. Boy, I want to say so many things, but <laughs> I would just encourage everyone to, to really um, think differently, to do differently, and to really facilitate our teams in terms of engaging them and seeing what needs to be fixed and help you know everyone being on board to, to, to fix those things. Um, it, re it requires a great level of vulnerability um, that we have to really listen and we, we really have to change our approach as it relates to leadership to something that you know, is more um, focused on, on people, a more people-centered approach and to really facilitate the teams in leading the charge and as leaders facilitating them in terms of you know where we want to head to the future and really get our heads out of that um, firefighting mode and to really spend the time to look ahead and to vision so that we can you know create that energy to pull our teams in that direction you know, yeah. Okay. Words of wisdom, words of wisdom, my friend. Thank you so much for sharing with us here today. And um, we will be sharing the slide deck with you. And you will you see that last slide, you will see that there as well. So if you want to get in touch with um, Tamara and the rest of our team at Jamaica Productivity Center, you will be able to do that. So Tamara, if you could stop sharing, so I could just share some, some final announcements. You know, we are going to be kicking off next, um, next month, instead of one webinar per month, we're actually, and today's webinar really sets the tone, I believe, for the webinar series that we are going to be embarking on next month. So starting, the theme is citizen-centered service excellence, right? And we want to focus even more on this business of public service excellence. What is it? And how can we actually achieve this, this excellence? And so on May 4, we are going to be looking at policy approaches to achieving service excellence. And our guests will be presenters from the Cabinet Office of Jamaica, the Public Sector Modernization and Transformation Division. On May 11, so notice these are Wednesdays. So these are going to be not your usual one hour webinar, we um, block about an hour and a half for those webinars. May 11, we're going to be featuring the team from St. Lucia and their DigiGov um, initiative where they have been really di using digitization to improve service excellence for a number of public sector, public service transactions. May 18, we're going to feature 
the Welfare Department of Barbados and really talking about the experience they've had over the last two years with just COVID descending on them, plus ash, <laughs> ash from the St. Vincent's referral, again, and all of that good stuff. And basically looking at how people had to really rapidly employ digitization as a way to continue business services, continue to deliver welfare services, where there was increased demand for welfare services in a time of crisis. And then on May 25, we will have Dr. Jean Germain, what's her name? Germain Joël Jean-Pierre, um, who is from the Commonwealth of Dominica, a, a really um, recognized IT expert at our alumni. And she will be looking at implementing a user-centered approach to digitization of public services. Have you seen those websites, those that you're like, okay, I know they think they're doing us good, but this is far from it. It is not user-friendly, hot all. Okay, so we just don't want to just digitize for the sake of digitization, but how do we use a user-centered mindset and approach when we are actually looking at digitization to improve service delivery in the public service context? So you can look out for the advertisements for that so you can register for all of these webinars, share it. They are all free. So thank you all very much. Um, we will be, um, so Cathy, you just see in the chat, we want you to just quickly share um, your evaluation by just completing the poll that is in the chat. All right, so if you could just fill that out for us, please. And so the email address that you use to register for this webinar, that's where we will send you the link and the slide deck. So on behalf of my team here at CARICAD, thank you so much for engaging with us. Do fill out our survey. We, want to, we always want to hear from you because we believe feedback is a gift. And we are seeing so many wonderful feedback comments already in the chat. Excellent presentation, I'm told, very informative. We are so glad and hopefully you know, when you log in and register for our service excellence webinar series, that we can continue this conversation because indeed service excellence is very much part and parcel, very much tied with improving labor productivity in the public sector context. So enjoy the rest of the day and indeed the rest of the week. Be productive, my friends. Thank you. <laughs>